Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. In honor of today's movie, Skinamarink, I wanted to try out a new, kind of obscured and maybe even artsy kind of camera angle. Where you can't see anything really, no, no people in the frame the whole time, just, you know, the wall, usually. Y you, you might see some shoes or something every now and then, but it's mostly just the wall. The dark, dark wall. Nothing going on there. Or, hold on a second. What is that over in that corner? Do you guys, do you see something? Or is that, oh, t uh, no, it's nothing. There's literally nothing. It's just my mind playing tricks on me. Okay, this is not gonna work. <clears throat> All right, that's better. So let's start with the basics. Just what the heck is Skinamarink? The plot synopsis doesn't really give us too much to go on. Two children wake up in the middle of the night to find their father is missing and all the windows and doors in their homes have vanished. Yeah, pretty vague. Well, it first came onto my radar a couple months back when a bunch of y'all started asking me to cover it out of nowhere. Not even heard of the movie. Then just from the title alone, I was confused. Skinamarink? As in Skinamarinky Dinky Dink, Skinamarinky Do? That children's song? which actually does end up kind of being relevant. Point being, I hadn't even heard of it before then, and I was like, ah, this must be TikTok's doing. That was indeed the culprit, as after a film fest screening, clips from the movie went viral on the platform. The new attention led to it being quickly snatched up and released earlier this month into theaters, where it racked up over a million bucks so far. Not bad for a $15,000 budget, I'll say. So with all that built-up hype, does the movie truly deliver on its promise? I'd have to say it really depends. People's opinions are all all over the map, with some saying it's the scariest movie they've ever seen, and others saying they found it so boring that they gave up after 15 minutes. Mm. I can understand why, as this is a very polarizing type of movie experience. There's a little more context that I feel is important to help us appreciate the intent here, at least, before we get started. It's not designed to be a traditional horror movie in any sense, and also doesn't really have much in the way of a plot either, which is why it's also going to be a little bit difficult for me to do this video. There are little bits and pieces of threads of story introduced along the way, but it never really provides us with anything concrete about what is going on. It's up to us to decide and put our own meaning onto things. The filmmakers obviously leave it deliberately vague. It's extremely experimental and abstract, like the aforementioned off-putting cinematography, that purposefully keeps our subjects always just out of frame. This along with the dark, omnipresent environment, instills an unease in the audience that is purposeful, but also quite effective, nightmarish even. This makes a lot of sense, because because director Kyle Edward Ball cut his filmmaking teeth making shorts based on viewer submitted nightmares. His previous short, Heck, almost feels like a pilot version of Skinamarink, here extended out to feature length. That's what Skinamarink is supposed to evoke, that childhood fear of the dark and the unknown, bringing that innocent nightmare to life. There's another interesting layer as the film was actually shot in Ball's childhood home, adding another personal perspective to what unfolds. The point is, the plot and all that stuff is kind of secondary, it's really more about the experience. That's why the movie is so polarizing. It comes down to if this concept worked for the viewer or not. I found myself somewhere in the middle. It did genuinely get under my skin at points, but after staring at so many walls and floors, the style does grow a bit tedious. But regardless, I commend what Ball was able to create here on a shoestring budget. It really is quite impressive. All that to say that in this explained video, we won't be able to recapture that feeling of watching the movie. So make sure to give it a shot for yourself first, as here we'll be focusing more on the story side of things and my theories on what it all means. So let's check out Skinamarink, breaking down the story, what the mysterious presence in their house is all about, as well as explaining the cryptic ending. We're introduced to the dark and grainy as shit footage that makes up our story, set back in 1995. Though it looks more like the 70s in my opinion, already kind of an anachronistic kind of thing going on here. Yep, that's how our entire movie looks, so better get used to it. There's a sound of a tape recorder going, and when the tape cuts, a voice voice continues. Kaylee is joined by her brother Kevin, sitting down with her on the floor. They call out for their dad and enter a dark room at the end of the hall. They linger for some time and step out silently, returning to their rooms. There's already something strange afoot, seeing one of their toys whiz around on its own, and we hone in on the open door. The kids venture around the dark house, visiting different yet all eerily quiet areas. Each shot distinctly leaves an area of darkness that we can't quite make out, making us consider that something could be lurking there just out of sight. That does appear to be the case as we pan around 
around the blank walls, another door swings loudly open. Kevin walks out into the hall and takes a seat facing towards his parents' door. Then a closet door is pulled slowly ajar, and a few pillows fall on their own, accompanied by a staticky shuffling sound. He's next seen at the top of the stairs, a voice asking if he's hiding. He whispers a count to three and hear a loud thudding all the way down the stairs. We don't actually see anything, of course, but it sure sounds like Kevin injured himself or was potentially pushed down the stairs. We hear the boy wailing in pain and the lights click on getting closer towards him. It's followed by disembodied footsteps from an unseen adult. A car revs up and drives away. In what seems like coming from one of our kids' perspectives, they approach a TV. There's the distinct sound of old cartoon fanfare, but we can only make out the blinding glow from the screen. Then there's the rush of what sounds like the family's footsteps entering, which must be them returning from the hospital. There's more of dad's footsteps and he whispers for Kaylee as another door ominously closes. The dad is later heard on a phone call, confirming that Kevin fell down the stairs and hit his head. We don't hear the voice on the other end, but he only replies with a vacant, mm hmm no, they didn't need to do stitches. Kaylee believes that he was sleepwalking, but we saw things differently. The kids shuffle around in the dark and once more try to track down their dad in his room, only getting silence in return. The strangeness is then really amped up. We hone in on a random wall and a window appears out of nowhere, only for it to quickly blink away again. This has affected their other windows as well, seeing their blinds are still there, but there's nothing behind it when lifting them up. They set out in search of their ever missing father as the same thing happens to the doors and more lines are pulled back, exposing another blank wall. As for the landline, they are only greeted by the disconnected tone after he dials. So they decide to sleep in the living room and pop on a VHS of old cartoons, as always, slightly askew. They whisper that they love each other, and it's back to lingering on the unknown in the dark. Sometime later, Kaylee thinks that it is time to get up, and goes to fetch some cereal, all bathed in a weird red light. Upstairs, the hall nightlight is curiously on the floor, and peering at the other door, they decide to investigate. She pulls it open, as asking for her dad, but there's only silence as usual. Another light is turned on in another room, but it wasn't the siblings. They check it out and find that the switch doesn't even work. So how was the light just on? Well, magic land. With nothing there, they return to drawing in cartoons, even featuring two slumbering kids drifting off to dreamland, just as our pair do as well. Pointed at the ceiling, we hear little footsteps and Kevin stares down the hall. Kaylee asks why mommy is crying, but we don't hear anything. Kevin is confused why no one has come home yet, and she doesn't know either. In the cartoon, a group of birds pick up a dead one and fly it away. Kaylee is just about to speak, but is interrupted by loud rumblings from upstairs, and there's more clattering from behind some blinds. When navigating the house, they discover a lamp and chair are mysteriously hanging from the ceiling. Right out of poltergeist, I see you, ball. They still have no idea where their dad is, and Kev thinks that maybe he went with their mom. We're not ever told where she went exactly, but it does sound like a sore subject as Kaylee shuts down the line of conversation. Must be something bad. In the bathroom, even the toilet is doing a magic act. Meanwhile, Kaylee scours their parents' room and an object falls from the ceiling. She continues painstakingly over every inch of the wall, finding a dolly there attached by its hair. Something scares the heck out of her, but it's just Kevin complaining that he couldn't go to the bathroom. She asked if he saw anything strange, but they quickly dropped the subject. No, I didn't see anything strange. You mean like uh, furniture on ceilings and dolls and stuff and toilets disappearing? Nah, I didn't see nothing like that. We focus in on the toys and a pillow is pulled out of sight. Kaylee is up again and in the blue hued spot. She turns back and there's a strange garbled voice that speaks her name from the dark void. Come upstairs, they suggest. She makes her way unsteadily through the halls, hearing the wafts of cartoon music that fade away. She comes to her parents' open door and steps inside to an empty bed. Dad, she squeaks hopefully and peeks around to a set of legs sitting on the side of the bed. Dad groans for her to look under the bed. Sure, whatever you say, Dad. She stares intently into the abyss, but quickly shoots back up, complaining she can't see anything. Yeah, you and me both sister. She tries once more, and when popping up this time, her mom is there facing away. She looks back, and her dad has vanished. Kaylee, her mom croaks, your, your father and me. She starts, and a door slams elsewhere. It diverts her attention momentarily, and then really lingers in on her mom. We really love you and Kevin very much, she continues. She asks for her to close her eyes, begging please. The shot weirdly fades away into total darkness, and when the lights return, her mom is gone too. Kaylee settles in on the empty spot, and there's a creaking followed by a quiet shuffle. She looks back as the creaking continues, and it almost looks like we can make out something standing in the door. Could just be my mind playing tricks on me, damn you ball! A strange voice whispers, and then her mom grunts, someone's here. Kaylee starts to freak out, and her mom calmly tells her to go back downstairs. Everything is okay. Sure doesn't sound like it, as there's the sound of bones crunching.
thing. She moans quietly, and there's an inhuman squeal, courtesy of whatever this demon-looking arm belongs to. Our one real certain sight of something actually lurking in the house, some kind of demon guy. She rejoins her brother at the TV, but stays mum about what happened upstairs. They rummage around the house and learn that none of the switches work anymore. Hope you like the dark, kids. The cartoons are suddenly muted, and the blue flickering becomes more pronounced. In the hall, the strange voice is back growling her name. It again looks like we can just make out the outline of someone there waiting for her. Kevin is seemingly unaware, restarting the cartoon tape on his own. While asleep, his building blocks and toys are dragged away. All of his stuff has been stuck on the wall, even including the cartoon tape. The voice turns to him, asking him to come down to the basement. He goes out hearing his sister's muffled voice somewhere nearby. I'm scared, she cries. I feel strange. He stumbles around in the darkness, coming to a pair of legs. We briefly see Kaylee's face, noticing that her eyes are strange and, well, gone, along with her mouth looking closed up for good. He runs back to the relative safety of the living room. The stuff is still on the wall, which we recall is where a phantom window was spotted earlier. On TV, the cartoon guy opens a door only to comically find a never-ending assault of others behind each one, which again seems oddly relevant to our situation, with all these doors and windows appearing everywhere, disappearing, potentially connecting us to another world. Kev later rummages through the cabinet, and the voice is back grumbling his name. He attempts to reply, telling it hello. Kevin, they repeat, sleep, and instantly his body slumps to the ground. And this makes us consider that possibly the entity was actually responsible for his whole sleepwalking thing. Through another cartoon, we are given a lot more clues about the entity's style. The TV blips on to another copyright-free romp, and the tape freezes on a still frame. The clip continues as we draw attention to a lonely snake plushie on the floor. As the clip sounds loop, the stuffy vanishes just like the doors and windows. The lights get brighter, and Kevin comes to grabbing his juice box. Similarly with the doors and windows, this moment actually makes it seem like the entity can freeze time. When it resumed it, this caused Kevin to regain consciousness and unpause the world just like the tape. The boy returns to his building blocks and gets to construction. The voice tells him that he wants to play too. Kevin, the voice repeats, and more sharply demands to play. The boy is unbothered and gets back to scavenging through his piles of pieces. His new friend gets more adamant, opening a drawer in the kitchen. The same clip repeats in a loop on a particular moment where the rabbit keeps making himself disappear. And just like the bunny, Kevin is no longer there. He pops into another room, his breath heaving. The voice calls for him, and the cartoons of comfort briefly turn on. There's more rummaging in the kitchen, hearing a safety knife blade clicking into place. Put the knife in your eye, the voice commands. There's a quick flash of him in a strange position, and then more pained moaning from downstairs. Kevin cries in horror, seeing a stream of blood splatter on the wood. The voice tells him to wake up, and Kevin shoots up out of breath, walking clumsily in the dark. A window is there, completely soaked in more blood. The cartoons continue, but it's getting harder and harder to make out the details. It gets distorted and slows down, and then faster and more out of tune. We are treated to several askew angles around the house, along with a strange warbling tone. The living room is now completely dark too, no comforting light of the TV anymore. He slowly wanders through his toys, just barely seeing the top of his little noggin. There's shots of the family, and then the back of Kaylee's head, also in front of the dark TV. The tone returns, now focused on the dark TV. There's a weird beeping noise, and he's back to clumsily bumping around. He retrieves a flashlight, finding the phone hanging off the line. However, based on its tone now, it should work unlike before. He dials 911 and is asked by a dispatcher what's his emergency. He explains that he cut himself with a knife and he feels sick. They ask his age, but the audio goes out on his answer. He's four years old. They ask him to be a brave little guy and stay on the phone to which he agrees. As for his mom and dad, nope, they're not home. They then are curious why he's whispering. Is there someone else in the house with you? He gazes down towards the ominous darkness and they inquire where he is. Downstairs, he whispers, but he's completely confused because all of the doors in the house are gone. He suddenly grows weary and the phone plonks to the ground. There's another wave of darkness and he turns on the flashlight. He lingers on a toy car and accuses the entity of doing that. A strange voice laughs uncannily, which becomes more demonic, before giving way once more to complete silence. Through the sound of steadily growing static, we float through the rooms and ceilings. Feels like we are literally seeing the thing moving him around the house. Kev is curious how they can do that. I can do anything, the voice replies. However, Kaylee did not do as she was told. She wanted her mom and dad, so I took her mouth away. It invites him upstairs, and we transition to him now upside down. He comes to his parents' room, and the light goes dark, causing Kevin to whimper in fear. It's okay, the voice reassures him. I will protect you. Yeah, sure, guy. There's weird banging noises and more muffled rumbling, and it appears that he's now on the ceiling, shakily pointing his light around. Keep going, it encourages. He tiptoes back to his parents' door, entering into the pitch black. It's upside down in here as well. The door begins to float further and further away, 
away as Kevin is sucked into the void. Can I go back now, he asks. Uh, no. We keep pulling out and the world is almost no details at this point, just becoming fuzzy shapes. What sounds like an animal howls, along with a straight up monster screech. The growls get louder and then go completely quiet. Kevin clicks his light back on to all of his stuff, including the tape recorder, with its innards unspooled in a pile. A title comes on screen, 572 days, and I'm like, what? That's how long they've been trapped here? Whoa, that's crazy. And really iterates just how bonkers time is working in this kind of realm that we're dealing with. The cartoon music fades back in. You don't have to worry. You don't have to care. I'm a grizzly bear. The song says, there's a big pile of all the kids stuff jammed into a corner and a blue light washes over. We fade out wider, showing the room is just blank walls as the song gets louder. We pull back even further and the walls appear to go on infinitely. There's the click of a flashlight and we're back in the dark. This is followed by a red huge shot of Kaylee sitting away. It lingers for quite some time and she begins to dissolve, becoming one with the fuzzy image before vanishing completely. She has effectively been taken by the entity as we saw. We return to the upside down living room and the tape rewinds itself for the umpteenth time. The stuff is gone and there's another thud. We see the house is all by its lonesome with a looming blue fog emanating out. And I mean, there's literally nothing else around here. This all really makes it seem like the kids have been trapped in this entity's realm in which it recreated their house. Someone is crawling and gets the flashlight going, but it quickly goes on the fritz. It turns off, seeing the partial image of a face, but it's just the toy phone guy. Its eyes turn and it rings. He clicks the light off and the eyes are still there only to vanish. We look up the stairs, hearing the children whispering unclearly. A light starts to emanate out from the hall and the whispers grow deeper. We cut to a new angle of the hall, but with no audio. We kind of click through a demented slideshow of sorts, seeing old photos of presumably Kaylee doing normal kid things, but now with her head missing. There's another click and it's back to the darkness. We come back to an upside down hall a child cries and blood starts splattering onto the ceiling, accompanied by their cartoon tunes. It blips away and another child screams. There's a cut and presto changeo, the blood disappears. The voice laughs and keeps bringing back and taking away the blood. Mommy, a voice cries. This is probably the most disturbing moment in the film because from what we are seeing, the entity is torturing the children by making them just like the cartoon loop, reliving their moments of death over and over for his amusement. Yikes, a uh, rony. We're back in the living room with the kids and Kevin requests to watch something happy. Amongst a completely dark space, there only exists a single white door, hued in blue light, soundtracked with heavenly harps. Meaning they're in heaven, I guess. That's kind of what it sure seems like. We pan through another dark and vague environment, settling on a corner, again, considering what if something is actually there. We lose the frame to complete noisy blackness and something else comes into focus. What looks like the outline of a face. Go to sleep, it whispers. What's your name, the child asks. It asks the same back, and we linger on the blurry visage, which gives way to red static. Right, so as mentioned, things story-wise are left quite vague, and there are many ways to interpret what we actually see, which isn't really that much overall. There's a few elements, however, that feel more predominant, but at least to me, based on everything we see, the kids have been taken from their actual home and transported into a kind of alternate dimension by a malicious entity. There's plenty of evidence of this throughout, from the disappearing doors, the windows, and even the toilet. And then those specific looping moments or time freezes. It's as though the entity can bend and manipulate time and space, and when this happens, he can put his talents into motion, such as transporting the kids, as seen with Kevin, blipping him around the house, or knocking him unconscious as well. This entity is pretty much in full control of everything in the environment here. It can also at least kind of take control of the kids as well, sort of hypnotizing them to do what it wants. This all makes the most sense based on what we see happen, and by the end, both of the kids have been claimed by the entity, and if they aren't dead, they are at the very least trapped in here forever. This also works with the 572 days title that pops up before things start getting really otherworldly. Time and space has been completely tripped out. That leads us to think that the kids were being tortured for a long, long time. Not like a, a day or two as it looked like in the movie. However, the entity I feel like is really only a part of the story as there's a very obvious childhood trauma and growing up scared alone aspect going on too. But then even on top of that, there's the idea of how our memories work. We don't remember things exactly as they happened. It's hazy and discombobulated, and we don't always get the details right, which definitely fits right in with the visual vibes the movie is going for. It's like we're seeing a memory come to life in a way. We're seeing everything from the kid's POV, but everything does feel slightly off and unclear. It sounds like the family was already splintered and the mom had left the family. She now only lingers in the house in a way. This would also explain why Kaylee doesn't want to talk about it. Her mom is gone, more trauma. As for dad, he is still kind of around, but he is heard much more than ever seen. This 
this leads us to think that he was perhaps a more absent presence in their lives. They're always looking for him and he's never around. Thusly, I feel like it must have gotten to the point of neglect and with their mom gone already, the kids would bond even closer with each other just to survive growing up more or less on their own. Now this could actually all be the entity turning their trauma against them, but it could also act as a representation of those childhood fears and trauma brought to life. The predominant question that is most relatable of all childhood fears, what if there is something truly evil lurking in the darkness just out of sight? Well now we see that brought to life, metaphorically or otherwise. Either way, the house and the entity are designed to evoke our childhood fears, and all of this adds to the overall story concept as well. The other kind of theory that I had was after the first time that I watched was that we were actually seeing as Kevin in a coma, which occurred after he tumbled down the stairs. This would also help explain the strange, hazy feeling of everything, because what we're seeing is actually his mind sort of fading away. There's even that later moment when he asks the voice if he can go, no such luck, and he floats off from the door into a dark void, i.e. death, just another possible interpretation that I came to based on what we see. With that, we've reached the conclusion of this explained video for Skinamarink. But don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. And I promise, just like this one, I'll get around to it eventually. Might take me 10 years, but you know, I'm slow. What did you think of Skinamarink and its ending? Were you a fan? What was your interpretation of the story? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.